Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start in two minutes, so bear with us for a few minutes, and we're going to join you now. The world turns, and with each turn, a change. And each change makes it more complex, unpredictable, enigmatic. The world keeps turning. And from the Begither and Heredia practice, we anticipate everything that is going to happen. Brexit, artificial intelligence, new commercial borders, legal tech. The world keeps turning. And it commands the reliance on international lawyers who are capable of interpreting this new reality with integrity, honesty and transparency. Offering answers to so many new questions. Whatever it is, ask us. At Begither and Heredia, we know how. Okay, I uh, think we're ready to start now. Uh, let me introduce you uh, on the panel. Uh, it is a pleasure to have here uh, Rita Hill from Brexpat in Spain, uh, Association Helping the Expat Community. Hello, Rita, can you hear us properly? Yes, I can, thank you very much. Uh, on the other hand, we've got uh, from the south part of Spain, uh, Michael Davids, ex-honorary consul, a solicitor for many years. Can, hello, Michael, can you hear us? Hello, Ignacio. Nice to see we've you got, all. Yeah, we've got Pedro here from this today from the north part of uh, Alicante province. Javier, Pedro, hello, how are you today? Hello, Ignacio, good afternoon. Pedro is in the International uh, uh, Law Society uh, board and uh, he's uh, going to tell us tips of advice now about all these immigration issues. I'm going to pass on the words uh, to Richard, who he will like to comment, to start with some comments, some, some reflections about the new legal ed scenario for, all, for British in Spain. Uh, and then we'll pass, uh, you can start making your questions now. We've got some of them already that it will be on the panel and uh, we could discuss as well about a few issues uh, that Michael and Richard just come in. So I'm going to pass over to Richard uh, for you to start, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ignacio, and thank you for inviting me to this webinar. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time. I think there's two points that we desperately need to get over to people. The first is uh, a number of people are coming up onto our groups. We've now got 25,000 members across Spain. And quite a few of them are saying uh, they're hanging on to their driving license. Uh, they're thinking about changing. Well, that's not gonna work. You're running out of time. It's as simple as that. You've got until the end of June. If you haven't exchanged your driving license by then, you are gonna have to take a Spanish driving test as it stands at the moment. There are discussions I'm told taking place to see if an agreement can be reached between the UK and Spain. But at the moment, don't place your faith in that. So that's the first point. The second point is uh, we are hearing quite a few people saying that they uh, are thinking about getting their residency. They've lived in Spain, some of them quite a while. Now, this isn't just a limited time. There's about 33 days left if you want to get in under the withdrawal agreement. If you don't do it, you are not going to get in under the withdrawal agreement and you will have to look at the non-lucrative visa or the golden visa. That is your only choice. So if you are living in Spain, please do something. Apply for your Residencia TIE. If you don't, you've had it. And lastly, and this is causing us a real problem, many British people who are exchanging their driving license um, seem to be applying for a new one and handing in their old one to Traffico. It doesn't work. Traffico are working with DVLA. And if you get a new driving license and you hand in the old one, Traffico will turn down your application. We have had three in the last two weeks 
who have tried to do this so as they could keep a British driving license. It does not work. You must hand in your latest driving license to traffic law. Thanks, Ignacio. Thank you, Richard. Uh, now I'm going to just, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, we're going to start now with the, the questions uh, straight on. Uh, I think Pedro was going to just come in later on, uh, bits and pieces of non-lucrative visa as a reminder, what we need to know about non-lucrative visa, golden visa or the TIE. Now I would like to bear, uh, to send a reminder, you still, if you've been living in Spain, um, during 2020, you still have time to apply for the TIE, which is much more, uh, let's put it this way, very much faster uh, and, and uh, less documents required than the non-lucrative visa. Um, I'm going to start now just to discuss and just a, one question that we had on the panel about bank charges. Uh, and I think uh, Michael would like to comment something because he had experimented as well, some issues. Uh, I'll pass over to Michael and I think Richard has something to say as well about the commissions from the 1st of uh, January. Over to you, Michael. Okay. Um, yes, uh, this is just one of these, uh, one of these sort of new problems that have arise now uh, since Brexit and we're all realizing just how bad it is. Um, Spanish banks have always been uh, uh, expensive on their commissions, on sending transfers, receiving transfers, etc. But the EU made it illegal for Spanish banks to charge more for transfers coming from another country within the EU or being sent to another country in the EU than national transfers. So basically, a problem that used to exist with the very large transfers, large commissions on transfers to and fro uh, for other international countries. Uh, disappeared for us in the UK because of the EU. Well, of course, since the 1st of January, the, that prohibition by the EU to, for those extra charges has disappeared. And with that, most of the Spanish banks have started charging the maximums that the law allows them for international transfers. Now, basically what that is, is for sending a transfer from Spain to the UK now, a Spanish bank is allowed to charge 0.75% of the transfer. And we're seeing, and we're seeing that amount being charged very, very often. Maybe eighty or ninety percent of the transfers being sent right now. Also, on the receipt of the transfers from the UK, they are allowed to charge zero point four, with a um, with a minimum fee of eighteen euro. That some banks apparently has been sixteen is now sixteen euro. In other words, very, very high commissions. And I think what will be very interesting, as well, there's a lot of people watching, is let's try and find out which banks, because I know, for example, in my case, I can negotiate with the bank because I've got a, an account there and, and you know, we're, 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 we're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, 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 thing. But I'm very interested to know what, what people tell us about what banks are charging and what, bank, what banks are not. For example, Banco Sabadell, is charging all their clients. There's some, ex some exceptions on pensions and things, but in general, they're charging 0.75 on sending, 0.4 on receiving, minimum 18 euro. I know other banks that have been ch charging as well, uh, but there are also probably some banks out there that are not charging. And, I, and it's very interesting to see who's charging and, and, and who's not? Because enough, you're, you like ourselves, you've probably got special accounts uh, in which we get special deals. So we don't, we can't really see what's happening. And uh, I'm very interested to know because lots of people are asking me. So maybe uh, the people that are watching this on Facebook can say what bank they work for and what they're, what they're experimenting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Richard, would you like to say something or we're ready to go on questions on the panel? I think we're ready to go on questions. Uh, um, Michael's explained exactly the problem we've been having. I can tell you that Sabadell are charging a minimum of 18 um, and we're getting lots of complaints. Um, it appears though, that if people transfer in euros, not in sterling, that they are reducing the charges. Have you heard this, Michael? No, uh, uh, on the receipt, on, on definitely on the sending of transfers, they're still charging the 0.75% on the receipt of, um, of transfers. I, I don't know. I don't know for certain. 
I, I reckon that they're charging the same amounts. Uh, in fact, in our client account, where before we sort of realized what was going on, we were having loads of sort of retainers being sent to us and they were charging zero. So I went through my account one day and I was seeing 18, 40, uh, 100, 150. And I had like 3,000 euro in commissions uh, uh, like the, in two months. So I went in there and we managed to get them all back. But they, they still, at the moment, they're still refusing even on our account to do uh, transfers to the UK for free. In fact, they're saying it's 0.75%. And then we've got to negotiate on, on each single uh, transfer. That's where I am at the moment. So for clients, I imagine it's going to be, it, it's even worse. No, right. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we don't have a lot of time and you can see on the panel, we are starting to have a lot of questions. The first one is from Gavin. Uh, he's asking, what is the time limit to drive in Spain with a non-lucrative visa on a Spanish uh, on a British license? And, and the answer is, as far as uh, you are now on a non-lucrative visa, you will have six months to have the driving on the international license, and then you will have to do the test. Uh, I don't know if Richard wants to add something, whether there is any agreement coming up or not. Uh, because, Richard, you've been in contact with the consulate, and I don't know whether you could give us an update, whether there is any possible uh, good air scenario for driving license or for any other things. There are discussions. Uh, last time I spoke to the um, ambassador and the consulate staff, there are discussions ongoing, but there's nothing more. Nothing the yet. Okay, so it will be six months then, the answer, Gavin, uh, to, and then you'll have to prepare to have the international driver license and to swap it and do the test into the Spanish uh, license. Okay, now Steve is asking for a question uh, and probably it's for Pedro uh, with regards to non-lucrative visa. If you have this visa, do current rules in Spain allow me to travel to Spain? Is there any way to meet the renewal requirement of spending over 183 days in Spain without mm -hmm. changing my tax resident, which is a good, very important question, Pedro. Are there any fast track, uh, track options to obtain this visa? Pedro, what would you say to Steve here? Okay. I'll take it, Matthew. I mean, what you said is really, it's important to link about the, the residency or tax residency. Um, I would start saying that the first rule regarding the, um, once you become resident in Spain is that you are a track or, um, in most ways the uh, tax obligations in Spain. So you need to make the tax return in Spain, you need to declare and, and, and pay taxes in Spain over your worldwide income. So if you obtain residency and you uh, become resident in Spain for with the non-lucrative visa, which you are authorized to live in Spain, to be living in Spain for one year, then in order to renew it, plus two years, you need to show that you've been resident in Spain. So you need to be resident in Spain. So for that reason, that year, you will be tax resident in Spain. Um, then we, we can we can speak in nothing about uh, if is the residence is, is obtained at the end of a year or at the beginning of a year. What will happen that specific year, the first one, if it will be tax resident or not? That's a, a transition period at the beginning. But if there is any fast track in order to live or be residing in Spain without um, declaring or making your tax return, I, I don't. I don't think there is much options. Of course, this is the general rule. This is the 183 days um, living in Spain. Of course, if you need to renew, you need to show that you've been uh, living in Spain. So at the end, you are tax rate in Spain. Unless, and this is a very specific rule, if, if the center of economic center or all your assets or your work or your company uh, and your financial, everything is not in Spain, is outside and your situation is, is not like someone who is, is, is retiring here to Spain. We need to uh, understand that the non-lucrative visa is really a visa that was created, was focused for retiring people, even though at the end you fulfill all the requirements and you have a minimum uh, um, um, uh, money in order to live in Spain, in, in, in most of the ways you will, you will obtain the non-lucrative visa. But once you live in Spain, and this is the, the what I, I the a conclusion is if you live in Spain, you are resident in Spain, you are attracted to pay and declare taxes in Spain. Okay, thank you, thank you, Pedro. I think you, there is a good point here about what you said about the non lucrative visa. This type of visa is a minimum of, of six months to stay in Spain. 
which really puts you into the tax system in Spain, uh, whether you like it or not. I, I, Pedro, I think uh, there is another option for those who could afford it with the golden visa, which you could have a residency permit and you are not obliged to be tax resident in Spain because you could come in and out as you wish. Uh, but as you said, we've got the S scenario for three months for tourists, three months within the six months, um, which puts you into the picture of a non-resident tax code as well. And you don't need a visa. You could come in and out as a tourist. Um, so there is some questions here from Phil as well. You've got the option for non-lucrative visa. You've got the obstacle here about, I think, Pedro, we're talking about minimum 34,000 euros per couple. Uh, I think it was minimum. It is, it, yes, it is 33,894, something like that. It's 34, this is what, what we are saying, it's a minimum. Hmm? And, 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 the, yeah. and of course, I mean, regarding the, uh, how to prove uh, the money about bank statements, what, what kind of income are you going to show with pensions or is income from dividends from a, a company that you are working in? What, I mean, what kind of alumsum do you have some savings in the bank? How are you going to show this amount in order to, or is just rental from properties? Um, needs to be because at the end there's a, a criteria by some visa chief in order to see whether you will be able to comply this this minimum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I don't know if it happens to you and probably Michael as well. We're having a lot of inquiries, and now it's not only about the immigration; it's about the tax planning. And and, and uh, I was having a consultation today about the importance. We were trying to just get them sorted with the immigration point of view, but at the end of the day, you need to discuss the tax. Uh, the tax as well. Um, so as I said, three months for those who can come and go uh, uh, during 90 days within 60, six months, the non-residents, they could carry on being non-residents uh, in Spain. Then you have the non-lucrative visa, which is really going to put you into the picture of being more than six months because you've got the, the, the problem that you, they will not renew if you don't comply with this minimum requirement. And if you put you into that picture, you're going to be tax resident in Spain. So it's important for you to do tax planning on that. And then we've got the yes scenario for the golden visa for those who wants to come in and out because the rest of the visas might be a uh, work visa, which you put into the picture of a residency as well and tax compliance here. Um, so it's, it's a lot of things to discuss when you make a decision. We've got here Phil, um, who's asking about uh, the same subject. Um, um, they have a house in Spain since 2002, and they want uh, to spend the winter in Spain from September until April. We have the sufficient funds, and we definitely do not want to work. Is there a procedure that could help, that can help with? Okay, Phil, I think the answer is um, if you don't have a problem being here for a minimum of six months uh, per year, calendar year, um, the, the non-lucrative visa will be the one um, to you, and yes, it does apply to Brits from the 1st of January. Um, uh, uh, Gavin is asking whether there is a limit on non lucrative visa available. I think Pedro, you said 34,000 euros money available in the bank, whether it's in the UK, any part of the country. Um, and then we've got one from Michael Winters um, saying that he's 56, resident in Spain, doesn't work cannot get S1 certificate. Um, will their withdrawal agreement allow me to get an S1? Uh, it says here, when I reach state pension age in 11 years time, or can I move to Spanish health system when I've been a resident for five years? Well, the, the situation I see here, um, I don't know if Richard wants to comment something about the S1 because uh, Richard, uh, I think we, we need to talk about the TIE or the non-lucrative visa. I don't know if you spoke to uh, about using the S1 for non-lucrative visa. I don't see at all at the moment. I don't know if you had any conversation with the consulate, whether they will accept it because the S1 was accepted with the TIE. Over to you, Richard. Well, as far as we understand, the UK is going to be continuing to issue the S1 um, all the time. Um, they haven't said no. Uh, but on the other hand, they haven't specified that they are going to. So I'm afraid that question is a little bit open. As it yeah. stands at the moment, the S1 is still valid. 
for people that apply, especially those that have already been here. If you're going to retire in five years' time, um, it's not an issue. If, however, you've come since the 1st of January, we hope it's not an issue. But, uh, Richard, I think he's already resident in Spain, so he's got his residencia, um, and probably he might have now either private health or just he could join the system if he's not eligible yet. So probably he's in a situation where he has health cover. Probably he's asking whether in the future um, he will have the S1, but you think in the future he might as have it. it. Stands, as it stands, because he is already resident, prior to the 1st of January, the UK have said he will get his S1. Okay. Um, right. Then I have here something Ian is sending us a question about um, the 90 days, 180 days rule. Uh, do you have a question, Emil? Well, I will search for that question. Um, if you're a non-resident, well, as a tourist, as I said, you can stay here during 90 days over a period of 180. If you carry on having 90 days over 180, and then another 90 days over 180, obviously I don't see an issue. I don't know if Pedro wants to say something, but that you shouldn't need a visa or anything. And I don't think you'll have a problem at all with uh, the taxation um, in Spain here. Um, we've got Sharon, what is uh, the deadline for registering uh, to exchange your driver license? I think Richard wants to comment this on driver license because he did insist so much to register your driver license. Uh, Richard, over to you. Well, my understanding is that that, um, that um, time has passed. You were given up until um, the end of the year to register and, and if you haven't, you've got a problem. I would still attempt to change your driving license, sir. Uh, we are told that they are being, in many areas, flexible. And that's really the only answer I can give you. Okay. Uh, we've got here uh, Susan Lord, who's saying she was registered here and resident for 13 years and changing to non-resident before COVID. I, I guess... When she says non-resident, probably she gave away the residencia and, and in the tax system. She's unable to leave Spain within 91 days as there are no flights. Do I legally stand still being in Spain? Uh, Richard, I don't know if you did go through this situation. A lot of people are a bit stuck, but I think I'm not sure if you are able to take flights now uh, to different countries. As far as I know, yes, you can leave Spain. I don't know if Michael had cases like this. Um, people being able to leave uh, to, to the UK. Um, Richard, at the, do you... At the moment, you can go to the UK. Uh, there is discussions, we are told, underway that Spain may be going on to the UK's red list, in which case you won't be able to. Um, the, you do have to take uh, COVID tests and you do have to self-isolate, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not sure where they legally stand, and I haven't been able to find an answer to this because uh, technically, and I, I'm sure that Michael or Pedro or yourself are in maybe a better position to answer than me, but mm -hmm. technically, if they exceed the 90 days, mm -hmm. it's a problem. That's correct. I, that, that's the way I see. After 90 days, you're not raising and you don't have a permit. But uh, I think um, it, it, it will be easy probably to just... Uh, uh, find out whether there is any flights over to the UK uh, or ferries from the north of Spain. And um, obviously, if it's major force, uh, I wouldn't see a problem, but as soon as it's possible to move, uh, because yes, you will not have any permit, you will not have a residencia, if that's what you mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the message. Now, Gavin is saying he transferred 2,000 euros from Verdin to Sabadell and got a charge of 10 euros, Michael. So... Um... He, did, he did well then, because the minimum is 18 euro. In fact, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a mistake there, because I haven't seen them... As far as I'm concerned, the minimum charge by Banco Sabadell is 18 euro on a transfer from the UK, and they even sent it to me in writing, how they've been given the order, that that is the minimum, and that, and that is it. Mm. Okay. I agree. 
Right, John Winderham here. Uh, not sure why anyone would use a bank to transfer money when there are much cheaper services available. Uh, for example, OFX. There are a lot of currency exchange company, but I wonder whether you did experiment at uh, uh, any of the panelists uh, if they could transfer. Michael, yes. Yes. Well, at the, at the moment, uh, um, uh, putting to one side other aspects of using a, a one, you know, a, com a, a currency company over a bank. Uh, just purely on the on the commissions from what we can see when the currency company have got an account in the uk an account over in spain and they move the money from their account in the uk to the, their account in spain and then transfer it over to whatever bank it is banco sabadell if banco sabadell is receiving the money from an account in spain they won't impose the charge what we don't know is what's happening internally in the currency company whether they're being charged and then passing on the bill or not. We've also noticed that some of the currency companies uh, uh, work, work their transfers in two different ways. Sometimes they transfer directly from the UK to the, the their final account, uh, you know, the Mr. Mr. John, whoever in, in Spain, they transfer directly to him. In their case, that Mr. John, whatever, is now complaining because he's getting a commission on the transfer by his bank. And other times they route it via their Spanish bank. And sometimes there are even currency companies that have been doing it They've, got, they've actually got the, the systems to do it either way, but they've sort of, for whatever reason, been doing them from the UK and now realizing this problem are negotiating with their bank to see how they can get around all, all this. this is a, so it, 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 there is a big issue. All this business of the bank transfers is, is a big problem. We're not talking about small amounts in Napier. We're talking about somebody selling a property for 200,000 euro in, in Mahaka, putting their draft into Banco Sabadell. And when they transfer over to the UK, they get 0 0.75. So that's 1,600 euro mm. bill on the transfer. That's, that, mm. that's what's happening. Mm. That's, that's what's happening. And, and Michael, uh, do you think it will be a matter of different currency exchange companies to swallow that payments and they might probably is, is it do you think it's basically up to negotiation with the currency exchange company that you deal with because probably I, don't uh, know. I mean, I, mean I, I imagine for example the currency companies what they'll end up doing is they like you or like us because they do a lot of movements they can probably negotiate so what I imagine they're going to be doing is if they if the currency company has an account their own accounts in Spain for example in La Caixa Bank or something like that they'll get their clients in Spain to send the money to their account there, and then they'll transfer it over to the UK, but they'll have a, some kind of deal with the Kaiser to transfer for less. I presume that that is what I we'll, guess so, yeah. I think, and I'll say, I mean, that at the end, it's all about, I think, uh, people putting pressure on the banks. In other words, if there are three or four banks, they're not charging commission, I reckon that we should all start moving towards those banks, and then and then maybe they'll they'll think about what they what they're actually up to. Because again, it's very painful to think that there's actually no extra work for them whatsoever. Because England is still part of what's called SIPA, which is the method of payment system that they use via IBAN numbers instead of via SWIFT numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Michael, it's going to be important to share these and find out what banks are going to be on one side on the other. And I think, I, I think it's all about encouraging people to speak to the currency exchange companies and see whether they will swallow that, that money or do the cheapest way. Yeah, Richard, over to you, yeah. Yeah, uh, we've just done an article uh, in Brexpats in Spain on this subject. And one of the things that people must make sure is that their currency exchange company is registered both in the UK and in the EU. Some sadly are not and that could be a potential problem mm. Mm. that's good that's good richard okay let's move on because uh, people are making a lot of questions um susan is saying uh, some banks uh, uh vvva is is having high commissions um uh, Kaishaban says they don't do on pensions so it will be uh, we will encourage them to 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 speak to banks and, and Michael, I take your point. Uh, we'll try shopping around, see which one is going to benefit most people, uh, and probably we can share it in our next webinar. Now we've got um, Norm. He says he has an ATIA. It's about advice from someone who's very familiar with the working of both in the UK tax system and the Spanish tax system. Uh, I, I think I recommend Norm. Um, we could do a personal. Uh, consultation probably with the accountant uh, and the tax department from the law firm, 
from ourselves. If you if you wish to discuss it, we really need to understand what is your specific situation. You can send us an email, and uh, we could just have in place a double taxation treaty and tell and tell you our our opinion, or, or if you prefer, you need to go a place where they've got this uh, tax expert, which we are happy to help you. Now, Susanna Munroy says, like Aisha is charging. Um, I don't know commissions yet, but I received money from a client and the bank uh, char uh, charged me for receiving. And actually, uh, Michael, uh, on the, on, we, we're banking, banking with both. And uh, Kaisha has got an alert here that is advising all the time. I don't know if it happens to you, um, saying since the UK left the EU, now they're starting to, to charge. I really don't know how much, but, but I agree here with Susanna. Um, that, well, uh, yeah. My, my guess is that if there's been, if there's no negotiation and they're making those announcements, it's because they're going to be charging the maximum 0.4 to receive a transfer, 0 0.75 right. to receive a transfer, and with a minimum, which I say, Banco is 18 euro. Right. Uh, the fact well, that they're putting that out is, 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 is basically, I think, announcing uh, okay. that they're going to be making the transfer. Uh, okay, Pedro, yes. We have a, a Michael has brought a to, to this webinar, I think it's extremely important. I mean, we, let's, let's, let's study and let's make another webinar about, about this, about bank, uh, how are they charging, which is the law, what should be claimed. And I think it's extremely important because it probably is all of, all of uh, the clients are suffering this kind of charging and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, right, let's move on. So as, as Michael said, uh, Please share your opinions on the panel uh, or even in our next webinar and we'll just uh, speak to different banks and see what is their position. Uh, I guess uh, probably, Mike, I'm just thinking about it will depend on negotiating with your bank. I don't know if you have some, some pensions, some funds with them and certain things they might be able to, to waive. I don't know, as you said, it's part of negotiation. But if you just open a bank account straight away and you have nothing and you start from fresh, I agree with you. They might end up charging you, uh, or they start selling you, Michael. Yeah, uh, but the, bank, the, banks feeling, the, bank, the banks are feeling very strong on it, and there are other situations where we've seen that the commissions are very easily negotiated, and this isn't one of them. I mean, as I say, for us, and we're always moving money, etc. Uh, the 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 receipt of the transfers, we've managed to get them to remove. But the sending of the transfers, we still haven't managed to get them uh, removed. And we deal with them all the time. So mm -hmm. if, uh, for clients, I think lots of them uh, are, are paying the full back. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, let's go with John. Uh, John is saying, I'm on a golden visa and spending 183 years in Spain. When I sell my property and make a profit. Am I still liable for capital gain tax, even though I'm no tax resident? Well, uh, the question here I have, yes, uh, John, but if uh, you say you're having less than 183 yeah, days. No, it says less. Hmm? It yes, says that's less right. This. Yeah. Right. Uh, my understanding, Pedro, if he's less than 183 days, he's a no tax code, he should be doing his income tax return as a non-resident uh, and them. But the, as a non-resident, I think Michael wanted to say something. As a non-resident, there is still capital gain tax. So yeah, the, it will resident is going to pay 21% on the net profit. This, this same person, John, later on explains whether he, if he sells at a loss, whether he can roll over the loss. Well, if he was selling as a resident, he could definitely roll it over for a full four years uh, for, against another capital gain in which he sells a property at a, at a gain or shares. But I think he mentions he's non-resident, so in my opinion, if he's non-resident, sells at a loss, I don't think that non-residents can roll over the, the, the negative capital gain into the future. Uh, Pedro, do you know if-, if Well, um, I mean, I'm, I'm reading right now what John, uh, thank you, John, for, I mean, of course, if he's less than 183 days, now this is something that is asked. People say, so I'm gonna acquire, I'm gonna apply for the golden visa, so I will not be able, uh, will not be liable for tax residency, no. If you spend more than 183 days in Spain, then you are tax resident, and then you have to declare and pay taxes accordingly. If, John, if you are um, spending less than 183 days in Spain, um, then you are not resident, so you are not tax resident. So if you sell the property as non-resident, first of all, will be retained 3% for capital gains tax. As you say, there is some, you are gonna make a profit. 
and then you will be subject into European Union citizen 19% or extra European Union citizen at 24% of the capital gain. Mm -hmm. So, so Pedro, yes, uh, now they will be taxed as a non-European, correct? Uh, that's what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, if the UK, I don't know, I don't know if they email says the UK, but yeah, it will be. Okay, yes, because now, now the taxation, uh, even on capital gain tax and even on non-resident tax, uh, that really it makes a difference whether you are uh, European and non-European. So this is a good point. I don't think John is mentioning what nationality, but I guess he might be British. Now let's move on. Um, we've got Dan. I would like to know more about uh, Raigo Social, especially what elements are critical financial requirements, uh, if not based on work, but pension, health insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and if it's rejected by Extranjera, uh, can it be appealed elsewhere? Uh, I don't know, probably we could do another another webinar about uh, Arraigo Social. I don't know if Pedro wants to comment something, but this is really give us uh, an open window to do another webinar about... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, probably we could make another webinar about Arraigo Social is that you've been three years in Spain illegally and you have a contract to work and, well, uh, I, I, I haven't heard really the question, but if um, if it's rejected by local by oficinas de of course there was a time in order to make appeal and argue your rights in order to to get this this arreglo social. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, Dan, we will just talk. The difference is 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 very similar than um, is it very similar to find similar similarities with non lucrative visa, but being you already three years in Spain with certain Arraigo, which Arraigo uh, is just being stick here in Spain for some time, socially or working, etc., etc. The question that you make, if it's rejected uh, by local Estranjería, you could lodge an appeal, reposición, which is you lodge the, um, and contest the Estranjería. Again, you have one month to contest. And then if they get back to you probably and say, no, you're not entitled to it, then um, you could go to the High Court. I don't know where you are contacting us, uh, but any uh, provincial court, uh, administrative court, uh, it will be lodged. That will take an average of a year and you need a court runner and a barrister to represent you there. Uh, it's very important to make sure you comply with the requirements uh, and probably we could we could uh, organize another webinar about what you need or what you don't need or do a, spe a specific consultation, okay? Um, John is saying, if I sell a property at a loss, all right. So Michael, I think he says, um, yes. So he already, and uh, he's been answered. Then we've got Ian, in terms of residents being taxed on worldwide income, is there a personal allowance as there is in the UK where a level of it income is untaxed. Well, straight away, Ian, and, uh, and, and just giving you the straight answer, uh, if you receive in general on income um, from abroad less um, than 14,000 euros, normally it will not, it's not an allowance, but you will not be taxed. Uh, obviously, we're talking about pensions. If you receive money from interest, etc., etc. Uh, then that could vary. But if you're purely interested on to know, uh, it's not an allowance, is that you are not paying tax. The allowance, it will depend on your personal circumstances, your dependents, uh, family, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There is an article that we could share with you for you to, to learn a little bit about it. And every year, uh, I will recommend you to read the updates on the law, okay? We are pretty much in no time, we're gonna just, uh, share it in a uh, blog, uh, the new rules for this year. Right, um, I think, um, can I purchase a villa less than 500,000 euros while in Spain on a 90 tourist status and then apply for a visa to stay in Spain while, while there? Thus bypassing non-lucrative process at consulate here in the USA. I think Pedro uh, is an American yeah. uh, and... Um, First thing, or first rule, I mean, there is no need to invest or buy a property in Spain in order to obtain the non-lucrative visa. It's not an investment visa. I mean, the investment, if it's 500,000 euros, would be fantastic in order to acquire and get the golden visa, the investment visa. So for the non-lucrative visa, what is required 
is uh, you need to show that whenever you're going to come an entry in Spain with a visa uh, to have a place to live. I mean, uh, U.S. Spanish consulates uh, in the U.S. Um, are applying for I mean a rental contract. Um, so you need to show a rental contract, a proper rental contract with the ownership. The landlord is the owner of the of the property or has rights in order to rent the property. So they check that you perfectly have a place to uh, to whenever you come to Spain to rent. It doesn't mean that you have to be living in Spain in that that property that year. All that year, you can change and buy a property whenever you are here, or just cancel the contract and and rent it in another in a different place. But um, is is not required to make an investment. If you do it, you have you have a property. Perfect. We'll help. We'll we'll show that you have a connection with Spain. You have some links into Spain because you have already invested in a property. But it's not a requirement. Mm -hmm. And. Um, while you are here in Spain, the 90 days, and you invest in a property, uh, well, for the non-lucrative visa, you will have to go back to your Spanish consulate, uh, whatever the place you live in, in the US. Okay. Okay, thanks for that, Pedro. Let's move on. We've got here a on the panel, and we were told yesterday that the British will be able to travel from the 17th of May. Could you tell me what the position is in Spain to letting Brits in uh, I don't know if you guys want to comment uh, anything. Uh, I think I think in Comunidad Valenciana at the moment, unless you're resident, you cannot come in until the 2nd uh, of March. I don't know, Michael in Andalucía. Sorry, Ignacio, I lost you, sorry. Yes, uh, people trying to come over to Spain. Uh, they're trying to come over to Spain in Comunidad Valenciana. We are close the, the boundaries until the 2nd of March. I don't know in, in Andalusia whether you guys are on the lockdown on the boundaries or not. I cannot well, remember. Here it uh, depends on the municipality. Uh, some municipalities are under lockdown. Uh, for example, uh, Mahaca is on, uh, on, on boundary lockdown. Uh, Los Callardos is, Beiru is. There's a lot, of places, a lot of places under boundary lockdown at a municipal level. Right. Okay. So it will depend and... Uh, where are you going to fly to? I recently have a client who was trying to come to Alicante and he was on the, on the airport in Alicante. His wife was there pretty much just on the telephone. They couldn't, and he went to, they had to buy, go back to Amsterdam because they wouldn't let him in because he didn't have the residencia. So, yes. but, but he went to Madrid next time, last time, and in Madrid they let him. So, <laughs> there, are so there, is, of, yeah, there are lots of people that, uh, calling us, say that they've heard that with the Padron they can come in and with this, but the official thing that we've heard is that they need the residencia, either the TIE or the green certificate or the green card. Right. Could it be that someone gets in? It's not, I don't know, because that's the problem, that every now and again somebody gets in using something different and then they yeah. put it on Facebook. And from what we've heard, it has to be the, the residencia. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I agree, Michael. The official, yeah, uh, yeah the official is a resident. Yeah, I think Richard wants to say something. Yeah, we've been dealing with this on an almost constant basis. And the advice that we're giving people is residencia or TIE will get you into Spain. If you haven't got it, don't risk it. As Michael so rightly says, some people seem to be able to make it, but it's more luck than judgment. Mm -hmm. um, the rule, quite simply, is you need a TIE or a residency at the moment to get in. And right. I would point out to people that Spain gave a seven-day window earlier this year to let people get back in and from the Christmas break. Uh, and if they didn't take it, I'm afraid that's their problem now. Okay, Richard. Um... Now we've got questions, time is running out. Let's move on. Wendy saying, this is a typical scenario as well we've been having, because you wouldn't believe how many questions about immigration and tax now we're having from, from, from recently, from January. Now Wendy is saying she's British and she's also Irish by descendant, as my father and grandparents were born in Ireland. My Irish passport hasn't arrived yet. And because I'm moving to Spain, the end of March, the end of March, I've had to apply for a British one. I have a Spanish partner. I'm getting the padrón, pareja de hecho, and the residencia, but would I have to use my British passport? If I do have, um, if I do have use it, 
and then receive my Irish passport, can I change all my details on the documents? I understand that with a driving license, it is different for British and an EU. Um, well, uh, the, the, the answer, I think, Wendy here, um, you've got the possibility of having an Irish passport. And that's really, to be honest, that's going to make your life much easier here um, with your Irish passport. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to come in, but I, I would rather go. Yeah, yeah. Michael. I absolutely agree. I wouldn't dream of starting any documentation with the British passport if she has an Irish one on its way. It's, uh, yeah. it's an absolute no-no for me. That's right. And uh, my recommendation here will be uh, get your Irish passport, get your residentia TI, well, the residentia, um, the green, the green uh, residentia. And, um, and I think your partner, I don't know what nationality you said, if he's British, he could join you after Pare Sorry? Spanish. Spanish. Oh, so he's like Spanish. Jadecho could be inscribed in a civil partnership registry. So, I mean, of course, first step, first option would be uh, Irish passport, uh, totally. And second one probably would be like a partner with Pare Yes. Yeah. Uh, Although it needs to be shown again uh, the sufficient money to live in Spain, a minimum requirement. But that would be the, probably the first step would be the Irish passport, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, if, if you could comply with the Irish passport and have it because of your status, because you're Irish, I, I agree with Pedro, that would be the first option. Second option, you still have to be a partner of the Spanish and family member of a European Union, but you will need a pareja de hecho. And I think Pedro, they will request there yeah. probably, I don't know, minimum 12,000 euros, isn't it, Pedro? Yeah. I mean, in order to do that, and uh, under our experience, it takes time in order to inscribe the pareja de hecho, yeah. the partnership into the registry. There are um, in, in, in Comunidad Valenciana, there's a registry, in Murcia, there's another registry. So it takes time. It takes, I would say, months and months in order to, to be able to register that. And once it's duly inscribed, you can add that um, resolution into the, the, the family member of a Spanish partner in this case. Mm -hmm. So probably, I mean, if she's going to get, uh, I think I listened that you said she's going to get the uh, Irish passport at the end of March. So that one would be probably um, an issue uh, in order to, to do it uh, that way. Um, okay. Okay, let's move on because time is running out and then we still have many, many questions here. We've got Alison. I think she's... Uh, uh, she's from Chile. I don't know. How long can a Chilean citizen stay in Spain with our tax obligations? I, I think it is a mixture of question. Uh, Chilean, they need to have their residency as well, or their visa. Um, but they've got the option to have dual nationality after two years being resident in Spain. Tax obligations, as we said, if you spend more than six months in Spain, you're obliged to do your tax uh, in Spain, but there is a dual taxation treaty between Chile and Spain. Okay, so I think that probably goes to the question. Rose, um, I think Ross uh, Leventhal, with a golden visa, do you need to apply for a Spanish driver license? I, I think we did comment this. It uh, doesn't have anything to do with the driver license after, um, depending on your nationality, Ross, if you're British, it will apply exactly the same. After six months living in Spain, um, then you will need to apply do the driving test here in Spain unless that both countries reach an agreement. Okay. Now, Philip is saying, what are the terms of Golden Visa? Pedro, could you briefly, because we're running out of time, we have 10 minutes here. Uh, could you briefly just give a little bit of guidance on Golden Visa? Okay. Well, if um, three minutes, I will, I will take. Uh, there are basically five, five um, um, conditions or requirements that are complied. First one is the investment. You need to prove the investment. Let's say that mostly all, uh, all the application for Golden Visa on investments are some property. You can invest in one property, you can invest in 10 properties, in five properties, in three properties, whatever is a property, and needs to be minimum investment of 500,000 euros without mortgage. For example, if you buy a property of 1 million euros and half of that is mortgage, it's perfect because you have you can show that you have invested uh, 500,000 euros minimum, extra taxes and, and any other costs apart from that. Mm. Uh, second requirement is that you need to show the criminal records for the last five years. Mm. That's extremely important. Mm. And you have to well, show, and there's not any record in Spain that you've been illegally in Spain 
uh, in the last years. Mm -hmm. That's also extremely important, and of course, in order to show that in Spain, there is no information on databases that you haven't been illegal in Spain in, in the last years. Then uh, you need to show that you have access to the public system, health system, or you have to show with a private insurance policy that you have access to uh, all the service covered by the public system with hospitalization and without um, without any co uh, um, how do you say co pago it's like a payment. Mm -hmm. And I would say the last one probably is, I mean, of course, is even though you apply for Golden Visa, and even though you have shown the investment, you need to prove that you have sufficient money to live in Spain. Golden Visa, you have to be minimum one day in Spain. That's all. Full stop. You are able to work in Spain if you wanted to. You are able to apply for residency in the future if you wanted to. Um, but you need to show, just in case that you're not going to work, sufficient money to live. And the, the amounts that we already said for the local divisa, which are the same, is at least more or less 28,000 euros and uh, another 6,000 euros. So at the end, it's like for a couple would be around 34,000 euros. Okay, Pedro, thank you for that. Uh, then let's move on. Uh, John is asking, he's saying he lived in Spain back in 1998. I had an NI number, but he lost it and uh, all the records of it. What's the best way to say it's, it's still valid? I think it would be the police station, Pedro, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's it's the only way to find the, the non-resident tax is with his passport, unless, but probably, it probably might be difficult. Uh, but NI number, it wouldn't be a problem because if you're concerned uh, here, John, is the NI number, you could, with your passport, make a new application. And if they could find it, it they will say you already have it. So that, that's not a problem. Um, right. Um, Melanie is saying that is getting very difficult to live in Spain with all the new rules. I see a couple of hurdlers with a driving license after six months and the tax implications. It appears that living in Spain for six months during the winter period will become a thing of the past um, for the new retirees. What do you think will happen? Um, well, um, I don't know if Richard wants to say something, but I, I think the situation where we are is being, as, is being always for the non-Europeans. And as far as I know, I think this is going to stay Unfortunately, but that's that's my personal view. I don't know if Michael wants to say or Richard, Pedro. Well, we can we can look at um, two other questions here. You've got Mike Leach and uh, Jeanette France. Um, they've said we hear there is a chance that the ninety to one hundred and eighty days will extend to one eighty three sixty. That's not no. even being discussed, mm -hmm. and people have to remember there are two issues here. You've got the Spain with its tax, etc., But you've also got the rules of Schengen. Um, and I can tell you from the embassy, it is not being discussed. So that's a rumor. Um, mm. And then further down, we had, uh, I believe the emergency COVID rules give us three months on visa from the end of the emergency date. A again, that's not been said anything about. It's another rumor. Uh, so, uh, no, there is, at this stage, nothing under discussion. And in my opinion, there's no likelihood of anything happening, certainly this year. Okay. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if Michael wants to pick up some of the questions. Pedro, we're going to have a few more. Uh, I'm going to just say Michael Tears is saying he, he bought his house last year. He had an NI number, lived in Spain for three months last year. Can I steal? Can I use this to apply for a TAE? Well, the answer is no, uh, including with our financial proof, a medical insurance proof. Well, if you were resident for more than three months last year, you're still on time to make the application for the TAE here, but you need to comply. You need to have the 9,000 euros in the bank per person within the three months movement in the bank. Then you need to have a padron. I don't know, Michael, whether you have it. Uh, obviously, medical insurance to prove it and financial proof. And if it's a joint bank account, you will need double. So um, I, I really encourage you guys to, to get your TAE sorted for those who could prove you've been living in Spain for more than three months and comply with the requirements. Um, then we've got John, uh, can I buy a, a, bill, a villa for less than 500,000 euros and apply for non-lucrative visa? Uh, I think we did go through that as well. 
Um, I don't know if Michael has any any of the questions. Uh, he had time because I still have 42 to go and uh, and uh, we're running out of time. I would like you to pick the one that probably find it interesting because only reading is going to take my time here. Um, do you have any, uh, Richard, that you would like to point out? No, no, I don't think there is. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, Pedro, on. would you like to comment well, anything here? I'm not seeing any question regarding, I mean, of course, it's important to know about how to show, how to prove sufficient money to leave it to spend on an executive visa. And people is asking, how is the last three months, the last six months? Um, for example, a, man, a Spanish consulate in Manchester is applying for the last year, one year. And, uh, and we actually, in the, in the past, in some experience, uh, we had had it with six months minimum, it was sufficient, but at the end, we are showing one year time in order to show sufficient money uh, to live in Spain. And, and regarding bank statements, it's fantastic. Any of the income you may have or have, uh, lump sum and money, I mean, would be, would be fantastic. Not just um, income, for example, from, uh, from uh, I mean, dividends, also from a uh, rental property, but, this is our subjective criteria. If you just have some income from, uh, for example, a rental property, and that's all, I assume that probably will be rejected, mm? unless the, you give some guarantees that you will be able to, to show some of the money in a, in a, in a savings account. So it is, one of the requirements on the non visa and the golden visa is to show that you have sufficient money to live, and it's extremely important to show it perfectly. Sometimes you need to make the translations, um, with, with the public documents, which is not bank statement, with public documents, for example, criminal records, you need to make, uh, uh, you need to be stamped in order to be legalized, in order to be used in Spain, and also through all translation, all the documents. So um, it is something that uh, is always um, um, an issue, and also it's a subjective criteria of how to show, uh, how to prove that um, someone will be able to, 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 to show enough money to live in Spain. Okay, Pedro. Okay, uh, I'm trying just to go run through. Through, I would like you to please uh, put your email, uh, uh, Michael. If you could uh, send us your email, uh, Richard. If you will please uh, send us your email as well, and um, Pedro, could you? I think Pedro wanted to say something. The, the line was yeah, breaking. Yes, I'm just Pedro. watching one of a, another. I mean, there are um, more than fifty, I think. But I am. I'm someone called John. It says, is there 500,000 euros gold for golden visa for a married couple or it is for each person? That's a good question. Yeah, we, we Which one said, this Petra? In... Say it again. Each person. Say, is 500,000 euros for the golden visa for oh, a yes. married couple or it is for each person? We, we, question, Petra, yeah. we always say it's extremely important whatever you say in the deed of purchase, whenever you invest, you buy the property or properties. And if you are buying it with your partner, with your spouse, um, it's extremely important what to say because if, and if you say this is like a, you are a marriage or the agreement of your marriage is like is totally separated on economic, and you buy five hundred thousand euros property, you will be rejected on the golden visa totally. Hmm? So you need to okay. you need to show an deed that the property is communal property. Hmm? Is we call it in Spanish. Gananciales, which is a, it's a property which is joined and, and owned by both of you without separate private assets. Mm? And then if it's 500,000 euros, one of you, one of the spouses will apply for a golden visa and the other spouse will apply as a family member. But it's extremely important to include perfectly the wording in the purchase deed according to, according to of course, of the reality. Mm? Without, without lying, but it's extremely important to, to say perfectly and correctly that. Okay, thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, actually, what I will encourage people to do is few things. Uh, do consultation with expert all the time, do tax planning and do immigration. It is important uh, more than ever to do it in advance and I will highly recommend you to do. So Michael has left you the email, uh, Richard and Pedro, uh, in case you need a specific. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'm gonna pass you over to Juan for now, and uh, I would like to say goodbye to you and probably see you soon in the next Ignacio. webinar. Ignacio. 
Okay, and uh, see you soon. Yes. You're new to Spain and in need of legal help. When you are in a country that is foreign to you, you want someone who speaks your language, who understands you, and who will have an answer to all immigration and nationality matters. At Payacer and Heredia, you can count on a specialist in international law and a multidisciplinary team that can help you handle all the necessary formalities. Do you want to take advantage of the Golden Visa program? We will help you obtain the residence visa for investors through the purchase of a property or via a business project that you're looking to develop in Spain. Do you need a residence permit? Obtain it for non-profit purposes or through family, work, study, research and training purposes. If, on the other hand, what you are looking for is a renewal, we take care of the whole process. So all you need to do is leave your fingerprint. We also deal with re-entry permits in the case that you want to leave and return to Spain. And of course, we help you obtain the certificate of registration as a European citizen, the foreigner's identity number, Spanish citizenship, and the certified translation of documents in all languages. Because at Pelletier and Heredia, we know that speaking your language is the only way to gain your confidence. Trust that we repay with two words, professionalism and commitment. Pelletier and Heredia, international lawyer.